You're watching World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. Vaccines are seen as the best weapon to take a bite out of the pandemic. No wonder China recently announced that it would contribute 10 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines to COVAX, the platform. In the United Kingdom, the number of COVID deaths has reached 100,000, fearing the spread variant first discovered in the UK. European countries have also tightened borders and stepped up monitoring. But is the speed of research keeping pace with the raging pandemic? How can global scientific efforts turn the tide against COVID? I spoke to Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, the president of the European Research Council. Take a listen as to what he has to say. I'm so happy to be joined by Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, who is the president of the European Research Council. Mr. President, welcome to the program. Tell me, as a scientist yourself, how much do you think we know now our limits of research as a result of COVID-19? Well, as you know, the, the main thing was to the capacity that was developed very early to identify the virus because the key point was it said it was a new virus. And uh, this um, uh, was done actually uh, in China uh, very early on and then shared with many people. And then uh, the key point uh, was to understand how different this virus was, how it was active. And this was made possible by the, all the progress in science and technology which allows to really um, do, I mean, the, the sequencing of the, of the virus and understand how it uh, penetrates the, the cell. And then uh, from that day on, people started to look for, of course, uh, medicaments, uh, cures, but also thought about uh, developing a, a vaccine. Yeah. And this uh, rush to have a vaccine has been made possible because a number of uh, of uh, approaches uh, have been followed in many different places. A lot of information has been shared. And then uh, the great success has been in particular new types of vaccine could be developed um, using a completely new approach. Yeah. And um, is uh, now they are available in the world, a number of vaccines, which mm -hmm. are, of course, now the difficulty is not only the science, but now the, the industry that is to produce enough of these vaccines to distribute them and to make them available uh, very widely in the world. So it was a huge combination of knowledge, um, then technology yes. uh, development, and then uh, of course, um, really, uh, in, uh, well, industrial production and distribution. Well, Mr. Bourguignon, to you, briefly, how do you see this you know, disconnect that we have witnessed over the past one year between real science and some of the you know, public belief and also social media debate. As a scientist yourself, how do you see this phenomenon? Well, I think, uh, you see, we're faced with a completely unprecedented um, crisis, uh, at least uh, in the recent times. Uh, of course, there had been uh, epi I mean, uh, pandemics before, but uh, one of this uh, which spread so quickly and then, uh, of course, the reaction of many, many countries was uh, how um, people wanted to know uh, the situation to, to get uh, a cure very quickly. So, of course, uh, there was um, great eagerness, many, many places to really, um, I mean, really find a solution and deal with the crisis. Uh, of course, uh, as you know, I mean, uh, de depending on the countries, the capacity to react, to mobilize people have, has been very different. Yeah. Altogether, uh, Asian countries, in particular China, have been extremely good at um, controlling the crisis, even if it uh, started to be serious. But very quickly, people organized themselves in a good way. Um, on uh, In other countries, because by lack of determination, by lack of... Uh, adhesion of people to the measures proposed, which were really completely unprecedented in terms of lockdowns. So this opened the way for a number of, uh, I would say, fake news and uh, on just on um, sustained on uh, really not, not uh, I mean, statements which were really not uh, backed by uh, scientific knowledge uh, to, to spread. And because people were anxious, they wanted to, to see uh, uh, answers to very big uh, to the, this very big problem, so I think uh, it's not uh, surprising that this has happened. 
for the scientists, uh, we, we know that the only solid knowledge is knowledge which is done in a very methodical way. Mm. That is, in a way in which uh, you, you make assumptions, you test the assumptions, you do uh, serious trials at the right scale, and you confirm it, and you challenge it, and so on. But, of course, uh, this takes time. And uh, clearly, in such a crisis, time is a very important variable, and people are impatient. And therefore, very often, uh, people, but also maybe uh, some uh, media people, jump uh, to the conclusion when the conclusion is not yet there. Mm. It's still being evaluated. It's been being checked. But uh, for scientists, the only good way of working is uh, one has to be patient, even in these very difficult times. In, in uh, one of the vaccines, which in uh, Western countries is very much developed, the one uh, by the company BioNTech and Pfizer, the, the man who created the company, BioNTech, uh, Uyghur Sain, uh, is a laureate of the European Research Council. Right. And uh, he um, got support from us to study uh, the similar type of vaccine for cancer. Mm -hmm. But then uh, he decided when the virus appeared in January to, to really jump on this and try to see whether he, with his techniques, the new techniques of uh, mRNA uh, vaccine, whether he could deal with this new vi virus. And the extraordinary thing, and he was not the only one to, to do that, others were do doing that elsewhere, mm. uh, he was able within a year to really develop a vaccine, which is an unbelievable achievement. So it shows that the complementarity between these two approaches, the one where you just look at uh, people coming up with their most ambitious ideas, and the other one where um, at a time uh, of, um, uh, I mean, you identify priorities and, and then you ask people to work on that. What you're saying, President de Bourguignon, is that plant the seeds during the sunny days. Then you will have a, the, a real little plant to prosper, right, during the rainy days. Exactly. So the, the Chinese say is perfect for that. <laughs> and I think the difficulty at this moment is to keep people, to keep convincing yes. politicians that it's still time to plant seeds. <laughs> because their temptation is to say, stop planting seeds and not just do, uh, just harvest. I but know, harvest, that's, they... that's exactly the question I want to ask you, Mr. Bourguignon. You know, uh, the Horizon Europe, if I understand, uh, is coming out. The budget is going to be a big thing after a huge debate within the European, uh, within the European Parliament and among the capitals. What's likely to be the real plan for the European Union for basic research and support organizations like yours to prosper? Thank you very much for asking this question because this... Uh, I know it's your daily struggle. <laughs> with, uh, in the fall a lot with uh, many scientists and yeah. also many people. Uh, you very rightly said that the parliament has been very active uh, to support uh, the fact that uh, there should be an ambitious uh, program to support research and innovation in Europe. And I think uh, they obtain uh, from the um, heads of states and government, European ones, of course, um, really some, uh, some progress. And altogether, in the case of the European Research Council, which was in some sense my responsibility, I think we managed to get uh, a quite a decent budget for, for the future. You know, there will be enormous amount of talking about, oh, we have to reprioritize because we are in a very difficult situation, which is true. Fighting pandemic, you know, recovering of the economy, jobless, all these are priorities for governments, certainly for European Union as well. How did you manage to persuade them? What is the articulation here? Briefly. Well, uh, maybe if you allow me three key arguments the okay. first one is that we're talking about a seven-year program so please don't be obsessed by this year or next year mm -hmm. you really have to take a long view you know in china and in chinese uh, philosophy taking the long view is extremely important so this was one of my uh, term please take the long view yeah my second point was to show the very good example that uh, at least at the European level, two of the key new vaccines were from people who got grants from us. So, uh, of yeah. course, not to stu study that vaccine, but to study other vaccines. Mm. So it showed that some of the absolutely leading scientists 
had already uh, produced uh, really the basic knowledge which mm. was needed to develop this new vaccine. So it was a perfect example yes. of the uh, need to combine, as you said, the moment where you plant seeds and the moment where you can actually harvest. And it's very clear that the, the base, support to basic research at that stage, when you really want to produce billions of vaccines, okay. uh, is as combined with an industrial component. Mm. And my last argument, of course, was to, um, to really uh, tell them that if we want to train the next generation of researchers, we really need to have to give um, really uh, some kind of visibility, some hopes and some perspective that the, the next generation will have the uh, will have really the support to develop its initiatives. So if you are serious about the future and think about the next generation, right. you must support also uh, this uh, long time, uh, this um, really uh, this uh, basic research with a, with a vision and the trust that you give to the scientists to really make them comfortable with the idea of becoming researchers. Well, they worked. Congratulations once again. But you know, there's one question, well, Mr. President. Please. You witnessed the tech war over the past two years between China and the United States, for example. We also know that geopolitics, as I said earlier, is becoming a little bit more complex, to say the least. So what's going to be the role of science cooperation? That is so crucial because nobody could do everything all at the same time. So, Mr. President, as a scientist and as one heading the very basic research financing arm of the European Union, the European Research Council, how do you see that? Well, I think uh, <clears throat> there are two, two parts in your question. One is first to really understand, and actually you already gave good arguments for that, that really the development of science uh, requires uh, cooperation because science is a common public good. It, it, I mean, science has no borders, no. and therefore international cooperation is fundamental for the development of science. That doesn't mean that the scientists don't compete. They compete all the time. Yes. Actually, they compete between, uh, with the, even with their next door colleagues. So, so I think the, the key point is to make, and to really explain clearly why this international cooperation, uh, at the same time with the competition, is absolutely um, crucial for the future development of science. That's one thing. And of course, the other element, which uh, is slightly different, is of course the, the competition at economical level or technological level is slightly different. Because in a sense, uh, the, I mean, the, the fact that you collaborate uh, is uh, not uh, seen in the same way, collaboration are more short term. So the second element which is crucial is to explain that to develop a fruitful collaboration, mm -hmm. people need to know each other. And they, these usually friendships all these uh, relations build over decades. Mm. They are not just about next next year. And uh, and that's why for, for the scientists, it's uh, extremely important that uh, the, um, there is some stability in the uh, international cooperation. Uh, I myself uh, have been benefiting a lot from uh, traveling to a number of countries uh, in Europe first, but also in uh, in. Um, the United States, where I spent some time, but also in Asia. I've been visiting many Asian countries. As you know, China is one of them. Mm -hmm. And each time it was really uh, something which I benefited a lot, uh, partly because people were developing uh, new knowledge, which I didn't know, but also uh, sometimes the approaches that people are taking are not the same. Mm -hmm. And you have to learn from the others yeah. uh, very early on. My first visit to China was 1981. so a long time ago in a different country almost. Mm -hmm. Last but not least, if you can, give me a 30 seconds answer, Mr. President. China, the European Union, what can we cooperate and work on on basic science research priorities? Well, the key point, as I said, uh, in, in science, the cooperation goes through people. So it's extremely important that exchanges of people continue to be very active. 
And that, uh, so therefore, at this moment, of course, it's a bit complicated, yeah. but I hope that as soon as possible, uh, mutual visits, mutual exchanges will develop. And in this context, for example, the European Research Council as a collaboration, uh, as an exchange program with the um, Chinese National um, Science Foundation. Yes. And we hope we can enhance this collaboration because in the case of science, um, beyond sharing data, what is extremely important is having people sharing ideas and knowing each other better. And trust also, so crucial. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President. Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, President of the European Research Council. All the best and be safe wherever you are.